This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. No matter how long we emphasize the need for real peace to all beings, there are still many individuals who don't accept our peace. If people don't accept our peace, where can it be found? Peace has to be found in us. We have to digest. We have to chew real peace in our hearts by ourselves. It's pretty hard. The nature of ignorance is to lack deep communication with nature or with the universe. It is to separate, to isolate, to create discrimination and differences so that finally we cannot communicate as a harmonious whole. These differences we create appear as fighting, anger, hatred, and war. We are always trying to fix the surface or object-discriminated aspect of the human world. In this aspect of the world, there are countless holes through which ideas are leaking. The idea of nuclear weapons, the idea of peace or no peace, the idea of armament or disarmament. But if we want to fix some aspect of the world, if we want to have a peace movement, it is necessary to remember that armament and disarmament are the same thing in a sense. They are a principle or doctrine created by human ignorance. If we attach to the idea of disarmament, we create a problem. On the other hand, if we attach to the idea of armament, we create still more problems. So why don't we see the idea of peace as just an idea that can be used temporarily in order to approach real peace? There is no other way to approach peace. To approach real peace requires a very strong, stable, spiritual commitment, a vow. Just take a vow. Make a commitment toward real peace, just like Buddha sitting under the dead tree. But remember, even though we do make a commitment toward real peace, there will be many individuals who don't accept our way. So finally, where can real peace be found? With us. We ourselves must remain with peace. This is pretty hard, but we cannot stop. Buddha has to continue to sit under the dead tree. This is our sitting. The more we sit like this, the more we realize the strength of human ignorance. There is no reason why we create this terrible situation, but we do, constantly. When we make a spiritual commitment toward real peace, day by day, we have to go beyond whether people accept peace or not. This is not a political matter. It is a spiritual commitment towards peace. We have to taste it and digest it constantly. Next, we have to live it. This is pretty hard because the more we taste and chew real peace, the more we realize human ignorance. But the more we realize human ignorance, the more we cannot stop teaching real peace, living real peace. Writes Danan Katagiri. Valeria interviews Josh Sandman on the topic of peace from the book Zen Practice in Daily Life by Danan Katagiri, Soto Zen Roshi. Josh is a family nurse practitioner working in an undeserved population in Oregon. He graduated from the University of Pennsylvania in 1990 with a degree in American Civilization and Psychology. He then worked as a programmer, analyst, and research assistant in Penn's Addiction Treatment Research Center for five years before enrolling in a doctoral program in theoretical neuroscience. 
For 10 years, Josh also worked in Silicon Valley as a software engineer before switching to medicine, a childhood interest of his. He is married with two young sons and an avid long-distance runner and does science as a hobby. Here is the interview with Josh Sandeman. So welcome back, Josh Sandeman. Today we will be talking about peace inspired by returning to silence, Zen practice in daily life, written by Dainan Katagiri. Before we get to this subject of peace, I have a few warm-up questions, new ones for you. The first one is, what is life to you? I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, you know, obviously for me, it's about, you know, consciously existing, like having a subjective experience, you know, seeing, feeling, thinking, all of these things, um, you know, and then I think for, for human beings, a lot of us, you know, are just, it's about trying to find your way in the world, make decisions about what you want to do and who you want to be and what's meaningful and what's not and what kind of relationship you have with others and what you do for, you know, all, all of those myriad decisions, um, which we can do with varying degrees of an awareness and intentionality. And I think that's one of the things that attracted me to Zen and Buddhism is that that's, you know, that's the whole point is that the more aware you are of yourself and your mind, the more consciously you can make decisions. And so you can hopefully make better, more constructive, uh, instructive ones that, um, you know, are helpful to yourself and everyone else you come in contact with. Yeah. Yes. What do you think is the opposite of life? In the trivial sense, obviously just being dead. <laughs> right. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, I mean, people have that, you know, metaphorical expression about the walking dead, you know, people whose interest in life or passion for life has just gone away or they're doing work that they find soulless and meaningless or even destructive or, you know, I think there, there's a way in which who we are as humans can be so suppressed that your heart's still beating, but in some fundamental human sense, you're not really here or not, or not here in a way that's not, you know, mostly suffering. Right. Right. I agree. What is the meaning of freedom to you? Well, yeah. That's a big question. Um, as you know, I have a fairly extensive scientific background, you know, and uh, mostly, you know, just to reiterate, I was kind of in theoretical neuroscience. So kind of understanding the nature of how networks of neurons can bring forth thinking and feeling and decision making and everything else. I think from the scientific point of view, you know, the idea of freedom is very fraught and, and it's what, you know, some people would call a convenient fiction because ultimately there's no one there who can be free or not. It's, you know, everything, including us, is just this web of, you know, causes and conditions, which is actually similar to what Buddhism believes, you know, that idea of anatta or, or not self or no self or no intrinsic existence you, you can't find anything in things if you look deeply enough because everything is so interconnected and interdependent. It's contradictory to, I think, some traditions belief in a soul, which is sort of like the core of your being and is independent and possibly exists forever. Um, and that soul could be free in some ultimate sense. But for me, I don't I believe more in the convenient fiction thing. I can't even begin to fathom where my decisions and impulses come from, you know, from scientific study, I know that they come from all sorts of natural processes of which I am not and cannot be consciously aware. But practically speaking, in my day to day life, I, I go about as what my brother Matt Fitzgerald referred to as might as well be free will. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's great. <laughs> yeah. So that's I'm, really I'm great. totally comfortable with that. I'm totally comfortable with I, I am I am what I am and I you know I have no need to be anything other than that. At this time, what do you think is the world's greatest need and what is your vision for a new world? Wow. I don't know on, on the one hand, I would not presume to know what the world needs. I'm just one person with my own experience. 
However, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that gets interesting yes. after the holiday. Yes. <laughs> At the same time, it feels like it would be nice if human beings could find a way to, you know, continue to work to create conditions that bring out the better angels of our nature and are less conducive to the less savory parts of our nature, like greed and hatred and um, selfishness, you know, and instead cultivate you know, set up conditions that are more conducive for people to be loving and compassionate and aware and understanding and patient and all of those things. But, you know, we, we don't get to pick and choose our nature, right? I mean, we're, our, our nature is vast and, you know, we have all of these diversity of opinions and personalities and everything for a reason. It's kind of, you know, evolution, nature, whatever you want to call it, you know, kind of made that. And so I kind of feel like, I do have that very human wish that we could be nicer to each other on an increasingly consistent basis. But at the same time, I also know that all facets of who we are are probably always going to be manifest. And rather than, you know, me worry about how the whole world needs to be, you know, I just worry about what I can do in my own little life you know, be consistent with my own values and the world is a much bigger place and I, I can't do anything about that ultimately. <laughs> yeah, I like that a lot. And that leads us to the subject of real peace. So my first question yeah. has to be this one. We often hear the word peace and it's used in many ways, in different ways. Peace of mind, resting peace, make peace, peace movement, inner peace, yes. world peace, and so on. What is your understanding and idea of peace? I think you're exactly right. I think we have one word, but we, there are actually many things, you know, that it refers to that are sometimes different. Um, but in Zen, and I think this peace on peace <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, by Katagiri, what, it, what it's kind of getting at is the Buddha had this insight that the world is kind of a rational place. You know, it's, it's a world of cause and effect, you know, and he lived at a time 2,500 years ago where people believed very different things, that the world was kind of capricious and its machinations were kind of, you know, the whim of gods and, you know, that there was a lot of very, you know, superstitious beliefs about what made the world turn. And he had a strikingly modern take on the world that in fact, it, none of those things we can prove exist, but by observing the world carefully, we can see that it moves according to causes and conditions. From the human point of view, in terms of his trying to understand suffering and why people can be cruel and greedy and miserable no matter what, how much they get and how much they buy, constantly making war with each other, is because people are not awake to what they're doing. You know, we're kind of automatons in a certain way, and we just blindly continue patterns that we probably inherited from our parents and our culture or our tribe or whatever. And because those causes and conditions are present, suffering arises, war arises, greed arises. And his insight was that by cultivating this awareness that's already within us, you know, and studying what we're doing to ourselves and others very, very closely, it sensitizes us to the madness in some sense. And we can make more conscious decisions about, okay, so this brings misery, this brings fighting, this brings fruitless argument. Yeah. And these conditions of mind and of habit, of body, speech, and mind, of what you say, what you think, and what you do cultivate peace and equanimity and love and compassion. And so he, he had this whole thing, and, and this peace story is just another way of getting at that, is if, if you keep, and this is what reincarnation I think actually means, it does not refer to the Hindu idea of reincarnation of literally being reborn in different forms. What he was talking about is, you know, causes and conditions continuing to repeat themselves. 
over and over again. He called it samsara or the wheel of suffering. We're just going around like a gerbil running in an exercise wheel. Right. If we don't make different choices, we keep recreating the same habits. And if they're bad habits, then <laughs> chaos. For me, the idea and in practice after more than almost a quarter century of it is that that seems to be the case. If you really settle down and pay attention, it brings about a kind of peace that can lead to all sorts of other peace, you know, Mm. with others and with the world, you know, because something in you has settled and let go of the things that contribute your part of the misery of humanity. Wow. In some ways, Josh, it's so easy to tell, isn't it, when we are creating our own suffering. But it kind of surprises me that some people don't see that. It's difficult, challenging for them to understand this uh, idea that they are causing their own suffering. Yeah. Yeah, I think self-insight, insight into yourself, uh, I think varies widely. It's another one of those things where there's a huge variety. There's people who seem to have no insight into their own workings whatsoever. And there are people who have astonishing clarity and most of us are somewhere in between. (laughs) Right, right. right. So true. And uncovering, he calls the embryo, all these seeds inside of us that cause all kinds of, uh, of things, good and bad. It's really, um, yeah. It's a long journey, isn't yep. it, to uncover all of them? Yep. So in the returning to silence, he talks a lot about real peace, which you have been uh, giving some insights here. I selected some specific points. So the first thing about peace, he tells a story about a king who decides to attack a country. Would you like to tell that story? The story is about the Buddha came from a certain kingdom called the Shakya tribe. And then there was another tribe or kingdom that was nearby and they neighbored each other and they had kind of up and down relations. At one point, so the story goes, the two kings decided, you know, as was not uncommon in ancient times, their son and their daughter would marry and help bring the kingdoms closer together and facilitate peace. However, the king of the Buddha's clan decided he would try to trick, you know, the other king. And he, he actually sent a commoner to marry. And why he did that, I don't think is covered in the story, but he, maybe he didn't want to marry off his actual daughter. But in any event, eventually, of course, the the trick was discovered and the king from the other clan was extremely angry and he wanted to attack the Shakya people and, and destroy them in revenge. So the Buddha found out about this and he went to the road where the army would be marching and he sat down in the very hot Indian sun under a dead tree, you know, a tree that had no shade. And he sat there in silent meditation. And when the king and his army marched through, they stopped and the king looked at the Buddha and he said, why do you sit under a shadeless tree in the hot sun. And he says, because it feels cool to be near my native country. Mm. So, and the king was very moved by this and he decided not to attack and he turned around and went home. But he had some bellicose advisors who kept whispering in his ear that, you know, this should not stand and that, you know, he would appear weak and, you know, whatever else advisors say to a leader to convince them that they have to attack. So he called up his army again and they attacked and they destroyed the Buddha's village and the Buddha silently watched this happening without himself fighting back. Right. And that's yeah, that's the essence of the story. Right. And from the story, Katagari, he kind of point some profound lessons. So uh, I'll be going through them uh, piece by piece, I guess. <laughs> the word peace came up. <laughs> In the book, he says, uh, real peace is not a matter of discussion. I think the essence of it is, is that peace is a state of being. And it's so it's not actually a concept. Concepts can point to things in the world, but they are not the things themselves. Mm, yeah. You know, as, as a philosopher once said, it never actually rains in a weather simulation. 
<laughs> yeah. That's a pretty profound insight. You know, so the idea in Buddhism is that awareness and awakening and peace, the, these things are, they're only manifest in the world. And talking about them, you know, might not necessarily the case that it's useless, but it's not the thing itself. You know, it's like the difference between talking about a really clever plan for training for a marathon, but never actually going out and running. Yeah. You know, you can't possibly become fitter if you just talk about it and argue about the different ways to train. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it's, it's one thing to talk about, you know, manifesting peace, you know, but to do it is, is, is the heart, heart of the matter. Yeah. Would you call it a practice? Yeah. You practice, you know, manifesting, you know, that, that word is a little fraught, you know, because it has sometimes kind of foo-foo mystical connotations, but, um, but yeah, that's the idea is that it's imminent in who you are, you know, right. as opposed to something that a philosophy that you're expounding. Yeah. And one of the things that he points, it's nature. So he says, the world appears as no peace, but originally the world is real peace. And then he mentions trees, birds, spring, winter, and not nature. So why do you think he made this association, real peace and nature? You know, as, as my teacher Tia said to me years ago in a, in a practice discussion, she says it's always quiet. Mm -hmm. Even a Who concert is quiet. And not in the sense of decibels and what's impinging on your eardrum, but the world is not at war with itself. You know, even when humans are fighting each other, It is just a manifestation of the nature of things that's neither this nor that according to any judgments or concepts. It's just, it is unfolding according to causes and conditions. It's impersonal, it is as it is, and it's, it's, there's a silence underneath it all. It just, the world unfolds, you know, just as it is. And, you know, the birds are exactly as they are. They are no other way. The trees are exactly as they are. They are no other way. There's no ultimate struggle with any of that. And even a person struggling with the conditions of their life, mm -hmm. in the ultimate sense, it's not struggle. It's just what is. Right. And, and so it's, it's, it's like the, how the world would look free of any human judgment about what it is or how it should be or shouldn't be, you know, and that's where the silence is because it's, it's beyond words. It's beyond, you know, the noise of our mind, you know, trying to figure it all, all out and say, is it okay? Is it not okay? It's just all things simply are. Wow. As you speak about this silence is so, um, it's interesting to, um, to reflect on it. It's not even a thought. It's like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's, um, it's profound. If we are nature itself, what happened uh, to humans, to human beings, that we came to the point of being stuck in this array of judgment, of con concepts and ideas and What is behind all this? I wonder, we can go back to the mind and then what is the mind? What are thoughts? But how did we come to, uh, to this condition? Well, you know, that's a, that's a very rich topic of research and debate, of course. We're a product of evolution. And, you know, what seems to be distinctive about our species is that we do not come into the world with a whole lot of specific programming. You know, we, we spend years learning, you know, we, we're not born even knowing how to feed ourselves. <laughs> right, right. So, but the cost of that flexibility and that ability to learn about the world is that it takes a lot of what we call thinking and assessment and judging. Right. We have to learn how to read other people to be sophisticated social animals. So we have to have imagination. We have to be able to look at things from another person's point of view. We still have these ancient issues of competing to procreate. 
you know, winning a winning a mate, win, winning enough stature in the society to get enough to eat. Right. It's kind of this rich but somewhat tragic mix of ancient mm-hmm. instincts and the brutal realities of surviving in this world right. combined with a mind that's designed to be very sensitive and flexible mm-hmm. and therefore has a lot of work to do. It's not like an ant where it's there's not much to debate about inside the mind of an ant or even or even a hummingbird. Right. For us it's mm-hmm. all up in the air and we learn our customs and, and, but we have this sense of autonomy. And so there's this tension between what the group wants and what you want mm-hmm. and, and, you know, which people you agree with and which you don't. And it just, it gets very complicated very quickly, Yeah. but it's what evolution made us to be. Nature doesn't particularly care if it's kind of difficult or miserable or confusing. And, you know, of every species that ever came into existence went to extinction for one reason or another. You know, nature just evolves and it's messy and it can seem really brutal to us, but the the logic is not really intended for our convenience or even our happiness. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. That's a very tough truth, isn't it? Yes. to, uh, To understand and accept. Yeah, you speak of human evolution. You didn't say the word spiritual. Do you ever use those words together, spiritual evolution? I do. It's difficult because, you know, in my heart of hearts, yeah. I'm somebody who wants to believe in progress. Right. I want to believe that humanity is is somehow in just an awkward adolescence right now, and we're going to grow up and we're going to learn lessons and the balance will be shifted towards a better world. Right. And, you know, I think for me, spiritual has to do with that. It has to do with not just our primal instincts and material, the material world and survival and wealth and power and all these other things. Spiritual has a lot to do with the evolution of our character, yeah. our sense of responsibility to each other and to all living sentient things, you know, our, our sense of that, our relationship with all of those things that we are interdependent, you know, the, the wisdom stuff, you know, the the wisdom, wisdom and character is kind of, for me, what I focus on when I think of spiritual and spiritual evolution. Mm. Um, But I don't know ultimately if that's really how the world works, if there really is any meaning, you know, as soon as you say progress or evolution, you know, evolution in a progressive sense, as opposed to just a ceaseless change, you know, it's like, well, who defines that? Well, what does constitute progress? And (laughs) some people may have very different ideas about what that means. And some people scoff at the whole idea. Yeah. You know, I guess it's one of those things where, you know, the personal and what I think is ultimately true are, are at odds with each other. But I, you know, I'm comfortable with that because, you know, that's the nature of being an individual. <laughs> right. Right. And that's true, Josh. So true. <laughs> yeah. In the book, Katagari, he uses the word spirit, spiritual commitment. So he says, real peace is not a political matter, is a spiritual commitment. And that's why I asked that question. You used a different word. You yeah. said immaturity for um, the state, yeah. the condition of, of human beings at this time. And he used the word ignorance, which is the same thing. So he said the nature of ignorance is to lack deep communication with nature or with the universe. What are some of the practices that we can engage in? to create this deeper communication with nature and the universe? Well, I think all things require commitment if you actually want to make any progress, to use that fraught word again. Yeah. Because if you don't have the motivation to recognize that you might not have it all figured out, that you might be ignorant, that you might have room for growth, you're not going to do it. (laughs) Right. Right. True. (laughs) And that's what the commitment is. Somehow, something in you has to shift so that you're ready to learn more about who you are and your relationship to the world. So, and I think that's, you know, I don't know that you can architect that because obviously if somebody, it never even occurred to somebody or they have no interest, they're probably not going to be impressed by what you could do about it. Yeah. But beyond that, for me, it's included both 
learning about the factual aspects of life, which for me is my interest in science. I read about evolution. I read about the mind. I read about cosmology. I, you know, I, I try to just learn as broadly as I can about what we know about the world, which I think really enriches you know, my sense of reverence and respect for it, in addition to changing how I might think about how people behave and why economies work the way they do and why we fight and all of these very relevant issues, but in a really broad cosmic context, you know, it's like, you know, there's, there are deep reasons why things are the way they are. And they, you know, as far as we know, they go all the way back to the big bang and perhaps before. And then on the other piece of it is, you know, it's less the kind of what I call the knowledge side or the rational side. And the other side of it for me has been Zen, you know, Mm. like really training the mind to be more present and aware Um, It just does things to you that, again, you know, are kind of beyond rational discussion of it. It just shifts you and it softens you. And it also just makes you much less alarmed about the things in the world. You know, you still care, but it's different. It's not like this insecure kind of frantic, oh, my God, we're all going to die or, you know, whatever. There's it's it's concern, but it's not based in like a primordial fear Yeah. And speaking of fear, so I know you have been practicing this for a long time, what Katagari calls real peace. So you have an idea what this uh, state of mind of being is like. Are you still afraid of death? Yeah, I would say yes and no. I think it's very natural to not want to die. I think it's a little weird to not care whether or not you die. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it would be. I agree. (laughs) I agree. (laughs) There's this lovely story that was, you know, Shunryu Suzuki, who founded San Francisco Zen Center, (laughs) you know, he died of cancer as well back in the early 1970s, I think. And as he was dying, he was with a couple of his students and he grabbed onto the hand of one of them, I think it was Richard Baker, and he just looked at him and he said, I don't want to die. Mm. And those were his last words. Right. On the one hand, people were like, well, how could a Zen master say that? I thought he was not attached and blah, blah, blah. But what he was reminding people of is it's not about not caring. Mm. You, know, you know, detachment is, you know, I don't care. You know, I'm indifferent you know, doesn't matter to me, whatever. And that's kind of sociopathic. You know, that's not necessarily healthy. I agree. The non-attachment of Buddhism can't really be put into words. Mm. You know, and it's like we got from earlier in the conversation when he's talking about real peace is not a matter of discussion. It's just a shift so that all of these things that are still true about you, your love and your hate and your irritations and your desire to live and to be healthy and to thrive, are just held in a different space. You know, there's some perspective on it so that you're not so tangled up in it and believing it like it's some kind of ultimate truth as opposed to just what it is to be human. Mm. Wow. And and that's what Shunryu Suzuki was acknowledging. As a human being, I don't want to die. And there's nothing wrong with that. His suffering about dying was ultimately real peace because it was just the truth. He was completely free because he was completely able to be honest about that. No fuss, no muss. Right. And he was also, by saying it out loud to his students, instead of just keeping it to himself, he was fulfilling a final act as a teacher of of conveying this to others so that they might realize the same thing. So it was just a beautiful thing, you know, and it's stuck with me ever since as one of my favorite teachings from Zen. Wow. So in a way, it might be that finding or accessing that real peace might create even more space. So we expand so much that we are able to embrace everything. Yes. Everything. We don't push away anything. Yeah. Exactly. And that's the idea is that the Buddha mind or your original self is the fact that you actually are infinite because you're, you're 
inextricably a part of something that's so vast that it can contain everything and it's got room for everything. Right, right. I love that. There's room for everything. Yeah, and what you discover is, yeah, that is your true nature, you know. Wow. How amazing, isn't it, Josh, to be able to embrace it all. So let me see. I have another. Yeah, he says something interesting, too, in a book that it is, here's the word hard. I'm going to use the word challenging. So it is challenging to access that or practice a real peace because the more we taste and chew real peace, the more we see human ignorance. So my question is, do you think it's more challenging to realize real peace than to remain ignorant? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I would have to say yes. It's one of those things where it it's sort of like physical therapy. Patients find that when they first start physical therapy, they're even more in pain and miserable than they were beforehand. And they, they usually come and say, I want to quit. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I just say, well, sometimes it has to get worse before it gets better because you're discovering the ways in which you're weak and the ways in which you need to get stronger. That's a physical context, but what Katagiri is pointing to is the spiritual context, is once you start to realize how nuts we all are. <laughs> yeah, right. It can be very painful, but you just have to keep going and you'll get through it eventually. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I'm wondering if there is like a moment where we do exactly that, get through it, and then we are there. Do you believe that real peace is somewhat a destination? It's the journey of a lifetime. It never ends. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Never ends. Yeah. And you have moments of disillusionment and then you just make room for that, too. Right. So I have a few more questions here, not too many anymore. He says that ignorance creates separation, isolation, discrimination and differences that result in hatred, fear, war, you know, the negative manifestations we see. Would you say that the more we realize real peace, the more we uncover the non-dual reality that permeates the dualistic world. It's a lot of jargon, but yeah, I think, yeah, that's kind of what, when, when you experience the world more as just the pure awareness of it, it's different from concepts and ideas and, and the way that all carves up the world into this and that. And which is not necessarily false. You know, Buddhism, they call it the two truths. I mean, you know, there's a bus out in the street for all practical purposes, and you really don't want to step in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, not a good idea. <laughs> so, you know, and at the same time, it's all ultimately one universe manifesting. It's like one ocean on which there are many waves, but it's all water, you know, and it's all one body of water. So both are true at the same time. There's a way in which the waves exist, you know, the bus, the tree, you, me, and ultimately they're not actually ultimately separate or different. Do you ever use the word non-duality or non-dual in all this dualistic world? I tend not to. I, I, for some reason, that term has always made me a little uneasy. Why? You know, where I live, there actually isn't a Zen center. I think, you know, if I was still talking to other Buddhists, you know, they kind of know what that generally refers to. But I think other folks, that's it's it's a little bit too jargony or, you know, obscure a reference, right. you know, so I tend to just speak, speak about it in what I hope is plainer language. Uh, so you're saying that's too sophisticated in a way. It's creating more concepts, more ideas. It's not simple enough. Well, just just the term, you know, if I, you know, if I refer to something as non-dual, probably people will just cock their head and say, what do you mean by that? Right. And then I would have to explain it in another language anyway. Um, yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> and um, my final question for you, it's about your evolution on real peace. Where are you at at this time? Well, <laughs> I think particularly over the last three and a half years, I think it's been amongst the most challenging for me where I feel like I, I have moments where, you know, anger and concern and frustration has gotten the better of me. But I think it's also been a great opportunity to kind of come back to my roots and my intention and my spiritual commitment as 
Katagiri would say, yeah, I think overall, I just feel like I'm, you know, kind of as committed as ever. And, you know, every day is a new day and you, you just make the commitment and do the best you can. And sometimes I'm far less present than others. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. It's always so yeah. refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> so in a way, we are all sitting under that dead tree, aren't we? I'm the full human catastrophe, and you know, I just don't ever try to be deluded about that and just work with it and against it. <laughs> that is <laughs> so. Thank you, Josh. I really appreciate your honesty. That's what I appreciate the most in other human beings. It's uh, being the the authenticity, just being genuine uh, for a change, <laughs> because yeah. we can use a lot of masks. <laughs> we could. We have that ability. Yes. Yeah. So would you like to add anything or even read a passage in the uh, Returning to Silence before I ask you one final question? Yeah, I guess I didn't, I didn't have anything quite off the top of my head that I wanted to read. So maybe just go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, it's a technical question. Where can we find more information about you, your work, and your services, future projects? I have a little bit of a presence on my clinic's website, which is, you know, if you Google Northwest Human Services um, in Salem, Oregon, um, I am on the you know, meet our staff page or, you know, whatever. And there's just a little bit of blurb about me as my, in my work as a nurse practitioner. And then um, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Wonderful. Thank you so much again for another meaningful and wise. Uh, the word is wisdom. You used that word before. And that's, um, it seems more than ever that I'm using that word more often. <laughs> wisdom, <laughs> for some reason, is a calling for wisdom. So I really appreciate your wisdom and your presence. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I really enjoyed talking with you. Yeah, we'll talk soon. Bye for now, Jess. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Josh Sandeman, please visit his LinkedIn page, linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Joshua dash Sandeman. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. I want to thank the Patreon members, Lawrence McGrath, Mark Basden, Terry Clayton, and Aidan Bickrock. Thank you again for listening, and bye for now.